Good morning. morning. I got a story to tell you. 28 years ago, I was secretary here at Unity Temple, and I got a call one Saturday from the minister here at that time, and he asked me if I would come down to the church that night at 9 o'clock. I said, sure. He said, please come to my residence, which is connected to the side of the church. So at 9 o'clock, I came down, knocked on his front door. He let me in. We went into the living room, and there were two gentlemen sitting there. He introduced me, and he said, we're going to marry these two. And I'd never heard of anything like that before. He said, we're going to call it a holy union, but you have to swear not to ever tell anybody about this. So I said, okay. So the church was completely dark, and <clears throat> we moved into the Charles Fillmore Chapel. He lit the candles, and he did a holy union for these two young men. Very, very moving. Yesterday, 28 years later, two gentlemen came down to the church. They said they'd recently got their marriage license, and they wanted to get married. Jose <clears throat> was from Mexico. Jose was from Mexico, and Garrick was from North Dakota. He was a Navajo Indian, and of course, Jose was Mexican. So we came in here. They had a few of the family members with them, and I performed the first legal marriage of two same-sex people, which was an incredible experience. And when I was doing that, the two of them stood on this very stage, held hands, and looked at each other, and the tears running down their cheeks was the truest love I've ever seen, or as true as any love I've ever seen. At the end, when I was able to pronounce them united in marriage under the authority given me by this state, it was just this incredible feeling. They embraced, their family stood up and cheered, and out they walked. Now, I think about all the things that have happened in the last 28 years from having to secretly hide and, and allow two people to commit their love together until yesterday when they were able to stand proud and not hide in the darkness and publicly proclaim their vows and move on to have a happy life together. Now, to me, that's what Unity Temple is all about. And that's one of the things that attracted me here is that we allow freedom and equality for all people. Diversity is praise, and peace and harmony are the rewards. I just want to move a little bit to say that everything we do here is the result of a choice. And it's not the choice of the minister or the board of directors or anybody else other than the people that are in the seats. Whether you're a member or not, it doesn't make any difference. You help make the choices that determine where this church goes and what this church does. And and as a group, as a collective mind, we have decided that diversity is praised and peace and harmony are the rewards. That means that anybody comes in is welcome, but... There is a, an encouragement to leave their discriminations and their prejudices at the door. The others will take perfectly good care of them. If they want them when they leave, they can pick them up. But in here, we all sit as one body, as one cell in the grand body of God. And everything is choices, every single thing we do. You're sitting here today, the life you're living, the person you are, is all a result of the choices that you've made up to this point in time. Some choices are good and some choices are not so good. But we have what is called the law of cause and effect, which nature has given us as a gift, it's a guidance, it's a compass, so that if we make a decision or we make a choice and it doesn't work out so good, we can determine what caused the effect that we're experiencing and make adjustments in the future. The law of cause and effect. For everything we experience, something caused that. And it's usually a choice that we have made. Now, I was talking to my cousin Ozzy not too long ago about this. Every year, <clears throat> cousin Ozzy and Lars Iverson, his best friend, they go to uh, the northern lakes in Canada to go moose hunting. 
And this year, <clears throat> they hired a, a, a pontoon plane and a pilot to take him up there, drop him off, and he used to pick him up seven days later. When the pilot came back to get them, he was a bit surprised to see that they had bagged three great big moose. Now, I need to just pause here for a minute because I searched this out through the weekend. Is there a plural for moose? Is it mooses? Is it mises? I don't know. I couldn't find it. So they bagged three great moose. The pilot said, unfortunately, Ozzy, you can't take three moose back. The plane won't hold the load. You can only take two back. And Ozzy says, don't be so sure of that. He says, last year we shot three moose. We put them on the plane. The pilot allowed us to do that. And therefore, I believe that we should be able to take three of the moose back this time. The pilot said, the plane can't handle that kind of a load. And Ozzy said, we did it last year. We can do it this year. Finally, after a long argument, the pilot gave up, and he says, okay, I'll load the moose up. So they put the three moose in the plane. It took off, going down the lake, and just as it had to elevate to miss the trees on the other side of the lake, the plane sputtered, and it fell, and it crashed into the brush at the end of the lake. The plane was totally destroyed. They were stranded, but luckily nobody was hurt. As Ozzie and Lars crawled out of the plane, Lars asked Ozzie, do you have any idea at all where we're at? And Ozzie said, yeah, this is the same place we crashed last year. <laughs> the point being, if you do a specific thing, you're going to get a specific result. If you do that specific thing again, you're going to get the same result. And everybody knows doing the same thing over and over and over and expecting a different result is the definition of insanity. I'd like to talk to you a little bit about the choices that we have here at Unity. If you can think of, uh, just in your imagination, think of a huge wooden uh, wagon wheel, something you might have seen back in the 1800s. And there's a hub in the middle, and there's wooden spokes going out from the hub. Well, here at Unity, we look at that as a metaphor, and every single spoke that runs through the hub is like a different spiritual path. You know, one spoke might be Christian, one spoke might be Buddhism, one spoke might be Hinduism, one might be spiritualist, one might be an atheist uh, spoke. And just to touch on that for a bit, I have a lot of friends that are atheists. They're good people, they have good lives, they're a beneficial presence to the world. They just don't adhere to any particular religion. So we have this wooden wheel, the spokes are all moving towards the hub. The hub can be God, if you prefer, it can be uh, good life, it can be uh, higher awareness, it can be enlightenment, whatever you want, but every single spoke is going in the same direction, heading toward the same destination. That is spirituality versus religion. Now I myself happen to um, claim to be a Christian, and I'm on that, that, that Christian path, but also, I like to explore other religions, especially the Eastern religions. I like Taoism. I like Buddhism. I like to venture out and find out all the other things that I can use to nurture my spirituality. And as a Christian, I don't believe that is out of line. I read an article for the Kansas City Star. And a couple of weeks ago, somebody wrote in, can you be a Christian even if you don't embrace, believe, or pledge to all of the things, all of the doctrines, the dogmas, and the creeds that some Christian churches uh, profess to? And I wrote, yes, you can. A Christian's not confined to the dogma of a particular Christian church. A Christian is somebody that studies the teachings of Jesus and then practices those teachings in his or her life. That's how unity started. It started with the Fillmores uh, having discussion groups in their home. People from every religion would come, whether it was Jewish or, or Baptist, Methodist, Episcopalian, Catholic, it didn't make any difference. They'd come and they'd talk about spiritual issues that were way beyond Christianity or, or the religion that the person went to on Sunday morning. And then on Sunday, they'd all go to their own churches. It's like bringing people together to talk about higher uh, ideas of spiritual thought and then letting them go and practice the religion that they chose. 
And that's still what happens here at Unity today. So I said, if you practice the teachings of Jesus, then you can call yourself a Christian. Well, the guy whose column ran right next to mine, who had the same question, um, had exactly the opposite answer. He said, if you don't buy, and, and I'm paraphrasing now, he said, if you don't buy into the whole kit and caboodle, you're not a, quest, uh, a Christian. If you don't follow every doctrine and, and all the dogma of the church, you're not a Christian. If you don't see that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, you're not a Christian and you're going to go to hell. Now, i got to admit, when I read that, my, my feathers got ruffled. Who has the authority to determine who's a Christian and who isn't a Christian? Who has that authority? And when this Yahoo <laughs> is telling me that I'm not a Christian and that I'm going to go to hell and that I'm not going to be saved because I don't buy into all the things that he buys into, I felt that was a little bit offensive. And he goes on to say, if you don't buy into the whole kit and caboodle, you should have the integrity to stand up and admit that and leave the church. So I quickly fired off an email to him and says, you know, you make a point whether I agree with it or not. I'd like you to come down on Sunday morning and tell that to my unity people. <clears throat> that if they don't buy into all the kit and the caboodle, all the stories, all the superstitions, all the myths that have come about through Christianity, <clears throat> all the, the, the very extreme doctrines and the guilt and the shame that they need to get up and leave. And I said, you better bring some bodyguards. We're, we're a peaceful group, but that is not going to fly, and we're just as Christian, or whoever's in the audience that claims to be Christian is just as Christian as, as you are. Now, practical Christianity is what unity was termed in the beginning. And once again, it's studying the teachings of Jesus and practicing them in our lives. And it's very, very simple. Jesus' message was focused on how to live a better life and how to make a better world. And there's a simple three-step process that he used throughout his entire ministry, which I use today. And the first thing is determine what it is you value. For Jesus, he says the primary values are peace. That's the greatest desire each and every one of us has. Harmony, that's our natural state, to be in harmony with other people and to be in harmony with the universe. And love, the greatest experience that we can have here on earth. Determine what it is you value. The second thing is, when you make choices, you choose to do things that are going to increase the degree of that which you value. Very, very simple. If I'm faced with a situation or circumstance and I have to make a choice, it's very simple to look at my options and say which option is going to increase the love, the harmony, and the peace in my life. He said, then when you make that particular choice, stay with it and keep your intention on exactly what you have chosen to do, and you're going to be happy. He said, happiness is having what you value to the degree that you desire. Very, very simple. As we move through our lives, it doesn't make any difference if you're Christian or if you're Buddhist or if you're, if you're Catholic or, or if you're atheist. None of that makes a difference at all, but it's holding on to the value of life, the greatest values of life, which are peace, love, and harmony, and using your power to choose choices that will increase the degree of those things in your life. Now, the problem is, oftentimes we find ourselves in a tough situation. When we're facing a big problem that doesn't seem to have a solution, or we have a challenge in our life we can't seem to move beyond, or we suffered a great loss, perhaps there's a divorce going on, perhaps a relationship has ended, perhaps you've lost a loved one, whatever it might be, oftentimes we feel that we don't have choices, that we are stuck, that we are in prison with the situation or circumstance and that there's nothing we can do. But that's not true, it's not true at all. We always have options. Always 
have choices no matter what we're facing in life. And sometimes what that calls for is to step out of this box of a problem or a challenge that we have and instead of focusing on the problem or the loss or whatever it might be, step out and look at it from a different perspective and ask ourselves, what options do I have here? And something will always come to you. Jesus said, if you seek, you will find. He says, the truth is within you and you will discover it. But it's just taking, taking that moment to pause and have the confidence to step out of the problem and ask yourself, what are my options? The options are always there. I had one young man, after I was talking about this, come up to me and he says, well, what if I'm walking down the street and somebody comes up and puts a gun to my head and says, give me your money? I don't have a choice. I don't have any options. I said, well, let me tell you about Jack Benny. Exactly the same thing happened to him. He was walking down the street. Somebody runs up to him. They point a gun at him. He says, give me your money or your life. And Jack Benny just stared him in the eyes. He put his hand on his chin. And the robber said, give me your money or your life. And Jack Benny said, I'm thinking, I'm thinking. <laughs> <laughs> he was a notorious cheapskate for those of you that didn't know him. Anyway, we always have choices, and we're going, to, we're going to continue with this next week and determine how we can get to the choice that is best for us, the best for those around us, and the best for the world that we live in. How do we determine what step to take and to know that even if the choice isn't resulting in what we hope for, it is taking us to a place that is for our higher good. We're now moving to meditation. I treasure all my learning experiences. Today we learned about choices and that we all have a choice. Find yourselves in a comfortable place in your seats. Take a deep breath. Remove anything distracting from your laps. In the Daily Word we read, a Chinese proverb states that learning is a treasure that will follow its owner everywhere. All my triumphs and tribulations are to be treasured. With each experience, I learn more about myself and my purpose. With every situation, I see the world from a new perspective and I grow. Each stage of my life has its challenges and rewards. And each stage brings wisdom and insight. 
How exciting to know life's lessons are unfolding. How wonderful that each day inspires new growth. My life is not stagnant or dull, but filled with new joys. I look forward to each day, ready to learn about myself and about the world. I treasure my life and all its lessons. And the scripture is from Colossians, the second chapter, the second through the third verses. So that they may have all the riches of assured understanding, all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Let us take this thought into ourselves. I treasure all my learning experiences, all my triumphs and tribulations are to be treasured. I treasure all my learning experiences. In the silence, where all knowledge resides, in the silence.